ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. William Sitwell is a leading British food writer. He's a restaurant critic for the UK's Daily Telegraph and he's a long-standing critic on British MasterChef. In the past few decades, William Sitwell has seen food fad after food fad come and go and he's declared himself an enemy of many such things. He abhors tasting menus and he is vaguely disgusted by the smears and foams produced by modern kitchen technology, preferring, he says, a place with a small kitchen, a modest, seasonally changing menu, a functional wine list, cheerful staff, and the buzz of conversation and laughter. William has written a history of how people have eaten out through the ages, called The Restaurant. And I spoke with William Sitwell at the recent Auckland Writers Festival in Aotearoa, New Zealand. William, we've just emerged from a period where just about every restaurant in the world had to shut down for a while. What do you think we've learned from that extended period of restaurantlessness? Uh, well, I learned not to publish a book on the day when every single restaurant in the world is shut. Um, <laughs> The other things I've learned, I don't know. You know, the, the, the pandemic was interesting for hospitality and with great respect to people in hospitality who spent quite a lot of time you know, complaining about the dire state of their industry. A lot of restaurants were propped up for quite a long time and very possibly slightly unrealistically because normally there's a big churn in the restaurant world and places you know, naturally close. And um, our, the UK Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, uh, in one of his great pitches for being PM, really, came out into this great uh, speech where he you know, extended a, a hand of friendship to the British hospitality industry. And I actually think a lot of restaurants existed for far longer than they should have done. And we're now seeing quite a lot of places close because they're, we're having that natural you know, finality in the lifespan of a restaurant. So do you think net restaurants have a natural lifespan then? I think a lot, I think a lot do. What, five, uh, six, seven years? Maybe shorter? Well, you maybe. know, some restaurants last forever and you have to sort of wonder why. Some restaurants don't last for very long, you sometimes wonder why. I often think that it's quite clear when a restaurant shuts why it shuts because it was just frankly <laughs> terrible. There are some restaurants that just that have monumentally bad luck. There are locations that never seem to quite work and someone, you know, some lunatic thinks that they can go in there spend another you know, few million pounds on it, uh, bring it to life and it fails again. So some places do have sort of a bit of bad luck. I don't think that, that critics these days have the power that they once had to shut restaurants. I think we're one of many voices. Um, I think restaurants tend to sort of shut for, for natural reasons. There are trends that develop in food that means that you know, people, places can sort of exist, but the kind of fashionista places that open for five minutes and shut, it's probably, you know, I'm glad they shut. If people, if they're only there for sort of vacuous, uh, fashion -y reasons. I think it's always a sure sign that a restaurant is about to close when the staff get hold of the in-house music system <laughs> and you're hearing like heavy metal or sort of hip-hop when you walk into a place. I, think I don't mind that. I think restaurants should close if they offer you a QR, the opportunity to look at a menu via a QR code. You know? <laughs> and it does happen. I think restaurants should close if they don't offer a telephone number so you can actually ring them up. Uh, I think restaurants should close if they can't actually give you a decent welcome. You know, the great Michael Winner, who was the Sunday Times restaurant critic, used to say that, have you got a reservation is n was not a welcome. Uh, they, you know, and he used to rail about that. He used to go, have you got a reservation is not a welcome. And, you, you know, when you go to a great restaurant, they sort of, you know, the first thing they say is, good evening. You know, uh, or are we lucky enough to, the, you know, are you dining with us this evening? It's much better. Are you dining with us this, this lunchtime? Rather than have you got a reservation? The new reopened Langans in London, um, they put a guy outside the door whose first thing to ask you was, have you booked? It's just like, you know, we don't want you in here. You're born into the illustrious Sitwell family, the great poet. Edith Sitwell was your great aunt. Did you know her as a child, William? No, I, she predeceased me. So she died in 1964. I was born in 1969, so uh, I sort of felt I got to know her through... She had two, two younger brothers, Sir Cheverell, who in private eye used to call him Sir Several Sitwells because he was rather than Sir Sir Cheverell. It was rather... It's a difficult name to say, especially when you've had a long lunch. Um, uh, we called him Sashi and Osbert, her younger brothers. Osbert predeceased me by a couple of years, uh, but I knew her younger brother, Sir Cheverell, Sashi, very well. 
And I sort of feel I've got to know her through learning her poems. I spent uh, a year or two learning the poetry of Facade, which is a very, you know, it's quite technically difficult to recite. It's what I call early white rap. And it does very, it is like that, because William Walton, who wrote the music, he wrote this music that was rather like rap music in that he took modern tunes and twisted them, uh, uh, you know, and reinvented them. And the poems are literally wrapped to the sound of the music, the very pulsating beats, and where the, where the words don't necessarily have any meaning. When the satyrs are chattering limbs to the flattering limbs to the forest and hearts, or the beauty of marrow and cucumber narrow and syrahs will join in the dance. When the satyrs can flatter the flat leaf fruit and the gherkin green in the marrow, so que Venus Silenus will settle between us, the gourd and the cucumber narrow. Blah, blah. I have no idea what that means, but it sounds <laughs> quite good. Um, so I, I sort of, when I was learning facade, I kind of learned to sort of hate her because I thought this stuff is so complicated. And then once I got it into my head as a sort of muscle memory, my respect for her really grew. And she was an extraordinary woman. She was ahead of her time. She was a very brave poet. I mean, she wrote a poem called Still Falls the Rain, Black as Our Loss, Black as the 1949 Nails Upon the Cross. This was a, a poem that echoed the sound of the, the, the bombers coming over London. And it's a very anti-war poem. It's a dangerous thing to do in war, to, particularly in those days. She actually read it at an officer's mess once. And uh, the noise of the sirens appeared halfway through her uh, declaiming this poem. And all the officers sort of hid under tables. And she continued as the bombs went off, you know. But she was a remarkable woman, had an extraordinary dress sense as well. Yes, you mentioned that as a kid you used to try on her clothes. What kind of clothes are we talking about here? Uh, it's quite a normal thing to do, yeah, you know. Um, Which one of us can honestly say we haven't tried on a dead poet's clothes every once in a while throughout our... Well, I lived in this beautiful old house in Northamptonshire in the middle of the English countryside, and um, her robes, her gowns, her turbans, her rings were around the house, here, there and everywhere. And it seemed a natural thing to do. You know, I mean, I actually used to wear some of them as dressing gowns, you know, if I had to go and put the bins out early in the morning. So uh, <laughs> they were quite heavy, you know, and she... She always said that she couldn't wear fashionable clothes and it wasn't an affectation. She dressed like that because it was, she felt she was a sort of throwback to her Plantagenet ancestors. And if you saw a turban that she'd worn and it happened to be one that Cecil Beaton had photographed her in, you know, pop it on, why not? Why not? Indeed. <laughs> I just didn't think anyone would ever mention it. But uh... <laughs> You were a journalist for some years for the extremely middle brow uh, British tabloid, The Daily Express. Tell me about some of the stunts your editor would ask you to involve yourself in in order to get some fabulous front-page story. Well, maybe I was an age where I was the kind of Sunday Express stuntman, really. The most ludicrous story that was going in the office, I would normally be sent off to play my part. There was this story that came in. Uh, apparently, Britain's most useless postman was a postman in Nottingham. So I was dis dispatched early one morning to watch Britain's most useless postman deliver letters really badly. Anyway, and I got to Nottingham, and I got to this particular suburb of Nottingham, and I sort of laid in wait with the photographer, and this dainty postman turned up, and you've never seen a man deliver letters more perfectly. You know, trotted up and down each path, didn't skip over a hedge, opened and shut gates, you know. I mean, I've never, it's, I rang up the news desk, I said, this is a great postman. What is this? And, and this, I remember this is in, the news editor at the time was called Les. You went, or oh, push him in a hedge, will you? You know, <laughs> it was always like that. And there was this ludicrous story where Paul Dacre, the editor of, great editor of the Daily Mail, once put a picture of Elizabeth Taylor on, um, in, on page three of the Mail in her nightie, in her nightgown, in the Betty Ford Clinic. And the Express thought this was rather unfair to portray someone in their pyjamas. So they dispatched me to the house of Paul Dacre to knock on his door so our photographer who's hiding in the bushes could spring out and photograph him in his pajamas. I'd come straight from some nightclub as I was a little bit tired, so to speak. Tired, very and tired. I don't know what it was, but I decided after knocking on the door that I would put on an Irish accent. And it's the sort of thing you do, you know, in the middle of the night when you're knocking on the editor of the Daily Mail's front door. And his wife, I think, it opened it and I sort of... I'd, I had a clipboard or something, which was my cover. And I sort of say, is Mr. Dacre there? I've come to see him. I, I, there's a, I've got a package for him. Uh, could he come and sign it now? And uh, <laughs> she immediately shut the door and they saw a rustling in the bushes above camera and obviously thought it was an Irish terrorist. So I was, 
hastily sent back to the office and, and they actually said, look, because you didn't get a picture of Miss Pajamas, we'll photograph you in your pajamas, okay? Right. <laughs> right? So um, I went home and put on some pajamas that so happened to be my grandfather's pajamas, because it's the only pajamas I had. They're beautiful sort of almost silk white pajamas. And in the first edition, I was in these pajamas. And uh, the editor looked at it and went, they don't look like pajamas, just like some, looks like a nice silk shirt. You need to change your pajamas. So I went to M&S and bought some stripy pajamas. And it always occurred to me, it was rather strange, that anyone who knew would have noticed that uh, I was wearing Sir Chevrolet Sitwell's pajamas in the first edition, but changed into a second pair into the second edition. <laughs> it was rather strange. I mean, one of the most ridiculous things, and I'm sort of ashamed to admit it, I wrote about this resort in the middle of Swedish Lapland. It was a sort of puff travel piece. And I was at home on Saturday, and it was for the Sunday paper. And they said to me, um, this is terrible, you know, you need some quotes. And I went, OK, how do I get quotes for people who are staying in this hotel? Anyway, um, I found this old ropey pornographic magazine in the house and looked in the index and saw these names and invented Olaf Schmidt uh, says, I like to jump into the sauna after being in the snow. And uh, Fritz von Warschenstaff added, nothing gives me greater pleasure than to throw hot, cold water onto the coals and look out into the beautiful night sky. And I wrote all this garbage, and they said, that's absolutely fantastic. How you got those quotes, we have no idea. I never let on, not until now. How did you then become a food and restaurant writer after being the kind of person who tries to catch Paul Dacre in his pajamas? I, I landed on this magazine called Waitrose Food Illustrated in 1999. Someone had mentioned that there was a job as deputy going, and I was sort of languishing, trying to work out what to do next, uh, having escaped from the Sunday Express somehow. I think it was this one stunt too many. Mm -hmm. It was when I was asked to go and pretend to be Liam Gallagher drunk walking through Trafalgar Square, <laughs> and I spent the morning having voice coaching lessons, and I had to walk around you know, that, the way he going, you know, Okay, eight, 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 eight. <laughs> doing all that. That was a bit odd. Anyway, so there was a job going as deputy for this magazine that had, was launched as Food Illustrated and tied up with the, the great supermarket. And uh, the current, the then editor came and interviewed me in my flat, actually, in Notting Hill. And I remember it was a very curious interview because she basically I made her a cup of coffee and she sat down and said, so what do you know about food? And I said, well, I eat. And I was going to develop this a little bit, you know? I had this line. And then she cut me off and talked at me, mainly about how... She wasn't feeling very well, and a friend of hers had recently died, and it was just a kind of odd interview. Anyway, an, eight, an hour and a half later, and she gave me the job. So I got the job as deputy, and then a few years later, she stepped aside, and I did everything I could in my power to get the job, because I realised, actually, that this was a very exciting world, because as a journalist, food is the greatest subject. It's about culture, politics, health, life, poverty, economics, misery, happiness, fun, frivolity, seriousness, hospitality. I mean, it is limitless. And I felt that I could really do something with this magazine and bring great writers and great photographers and great illustrators to it and make something of it. So uh, I sort of did that for a bit. One of the great correspondents you tried to bring into the magazine but failed to publish was one of Australia's greatest gourmands, Sir Les Patterson. Mm, yeah. Uh, what happened when you tried to get Sir Les to write? Well, uh, Sir Les Patterson, as some of you may remember, who, who, who said once that he literally sat on the international cheese board. Mm. Um, <laughs> he, he would occasionally pull, a, pull an Australian brie out of his back pocket, yes, I think, yes, sometimes, he would, Yes, he? he would. Yeah. And I was very privileged to know Barry, and he, was a, he was, became a friend of my family, basically because he was a fan of my grandfather's. And I remember staying at my grandfather's house once, and I saw these postcards from Edna on the kitchen table. And my grandfather's um, housekeeper, Gertrude, was sort of muffling about this, how this strange person kept on writing to my grandfather. Calling herself Dame Edna Everidge. Dame Edna Everidge. And, um, she could, and I said, this was, this was in the late 80s, a couple of years before my grandfather died, when Edna ruled the airwaves. She was the queen of the Saturday night schedule. But Gertrude and her husband only ever, only ever really watched wrestling and switched the television off in the evening. And I said, come on. And I said to my father, we've got to get Barry Humphreys down here. And he came down and had some books signed and became uh, a good friend. And my father actually persuaded Edna to open our village flower show a, a couple of times. And I never forget, we had this old coach from, you know, from the sort of early 19th century. 
And Barry as Edna stepped into it, so this very long tour around the top of the garden and then stepped out basically where he'd got into in the first place. I never get looked out at all these old, you know, ladies of the village, I remember, and, um, and so they said, as I look around today, I see a beautiful array of flowers, one or two cactuses. <laughs> so look at them. And then Barry had written this poem with, that ended, um, as for me, I'm no ordinary mother and wife. I was Dame Edith Sitwell in a previous life. <laughs> Which I thought was magic. And, and I interviewed Barry as Edna and talked to him on his own, her own, back in the house. Just me and Edna. And it was surreal because he completely became that character. It was fascinating. Anyway, I asked Barry, I said, would Celez write a piece for Waitrose Food Illustrated? <laughs> okay, a tribute to Australian cheese, perhaps. <laughs> And he wrote this absolutely diabolically disgusting piece. It was, piece, it was absolutely fantastic. And I remember one of the great lines was, he, he talked about how on a, on a stopover somewhere, he showed an air hostess his blue mauve vein. And, uh, <laughs> and then um, uh, it described uh, Tasmania as that bushy triangular zone down under where the cheese is second to none. <laughs> and uh, needless to say, my client uh, refused to publish it. And I said to Barry, look, I'm... I'm so sorry, you know, yeah, he went, it was a bit strong for Waitrose, was it? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, yeah, it's, um, it goes in the, the bin of the greatest pieces never published. And he, he, he also, he, he was quite a good little caricaturist. He, I've got this wonderful thing at home, which is a, a caricature of Celez um, waving a flag and holding cheese. It's fantastic. What a legend. Your book covers the history of eating out. It's a kind of a personalised account. I don't think you, in the introduction, you make it clear it's not comprehensive. It's kind of focused on the things you're particularly interested in. Sort of hovers around, really, the evolution of eating out, sort of in Britain, but reaches out to the rest of the world. But you can begin with the ancient Romans in Pompeii, which on that day in AD 79 was smothered in volcanic ash and lava, and so provides an extraordinary snapshot of what was happening on that specific day in what was a kind of a resort town for the ancient yeah. Romans, just south of Rome. What, what do we know about how the Romans ate out? What have we learnt about that from those ruins? Well, as you say, it was a resort town. It was a very fashionable town. And it had everything from hotels and inns and taverns to a thriving brothel scene. Rich and poor would hang out in bars rubbing shoulders with each other. Democratisation of hospitality was alive and kicking in Pompeii. And if you speak to archaeologists who've sort of studied ancient faeces in the sewers beneath Pompeii... Someone's got to do that job. Someone's got to do it. They'll tell you that the evidence of shit that's 4,000 years old uh, will tell you that the rich and the poor ate a very similar diet. And they ate fresh fish. They had... Um, in, in, on the evidence that you find when you see two groups of people who died covered in ash, and they'd been able to somehow measure the, the dental records of these people, and they found also that the teeth of the rich and poor were relatively similar. Which suggests the same level of nutrition. Absolutely, yes. and the same eating the same sorts of things. And the extraordinary thing about Pompeii, and because it is this snapshot that's captured, you know, it would have been a beautiful morning, you would have seen a plume of smoke just coming out from Vesuvius. Little did they know the devastation, devastation that would happen. But you therefore have a town that's frozen in time. And it's as interesting to me as a foodie to anal analyse that than any other kind of historian, because you can literally see the food that was being served. You can almost find the grains that were being used to make bread. You can see the early evidence of small, round, flat breads that aren't dissimilar to pizza. Um, you can see evidence of not just the wine that was being sold, but the prices of wine written on the walls of these ancient taverns. So you can imagine the wines that were growing on the fertile slopes of Vesuvius. And the word hospitality, of course, comes from hospies. It was a, an absolute fundamental principle of people in that age. And as the Roman Empire spread its wings, took its single currency, took its laws, it took the, the philosophy of hospitality as far as its tentacles stretched. What do we know about the wine they drank? They often write about drinking wine. There's an indication about this on one of the menus where they talk about the different strengths, which suggests that you can have it watered down, which again suggested it might have been thick and sweet. Whether or not you could get a 
a nice fragrant Pinot or a soft, gently acidic grass of Chardonnay, I don't know. Why did emperors often take a stand against such eating? Well, pe- lawmakers, rulers, have never liked the idea of people congregating and speaking freely because that's where information, disinformation is spread. It's where... Uh, Trust is built up between well, people. precisely. Yeah. And the emperors certainly went around knocking on the doors and frequenting taverns. And if you scan forward in history, you look at Charles II in England... Obviously, he was slightly paranoid about what happens to kings, given what happened to his father. And he was quite keen to shut down some of the taverns because he again thought that it was a, these were centres of chat and that could lead to disorder. You write quite a bit about the Ottoman Empire and the kind of food that was produced in the kitchens of the, the Sultan Mehmet II. That's a sublime cuisine, Turkish food. It, it blends Eastern Mediterranean food with the food of Central Asia. It's, it's a fantastic synthesis there. I was struck as I was reading this, you talk about how they would often eat on carpets sitting on the floor from shared plates. Is it pretty much just a Western European thing to eat your own single serve portion of food from your own plate? Because just looking back, I, I, it occurred to me that just about every other culture in the world has eaten from shared plates. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good point. It's really interesting. And Perhaps it's acutely English, the idea of, you know, it's mine. (laughs) Don't don't steal my chips. Whereas the ancient idea of hospitality was indeed sharing. And it's amusing when we started seeing restaurants the last 20 years come up with this idea of this really novel idea of sharing plates. And you kind of go, you know, this is 3,000 years old. (laughs) So I think it is. But, you know, food is always cyclical. And if you look at trends these days... It goes from sharing to non-sharing, authentic to inauthentic. I mean, you only have to really follow the trajectory of Jamie Oliver. It goes from five minutes, the fastest ever, to 15, to 30, an hour. And then it's like the most authentic and then the cheats version. And and recipe writers are always rebelling against other recipe writers and saying, you know, that's not the authentic. I'm going to give you the true thing. And then the next person goes, well, I'm going to give you the simple one. So these things always go cyclically. So it will go from sharing to selfish to sharing, take your hands off my chips to please have my chips. Sort of people like to peg it to cultural changes and so on. So it's quite fun really looking at that. My first book that I wrote was sort of a potted history of Constantinople. when It was the capital of the, what was known as the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantium as it's more commonly known these days. There was a wonderful story I found of a marriage between a Byzantine princess called Theophanu, who travelled to Rome to marry the son of the Holy Roman Emperor, Otto II. And at the wedding feast, they sat down to eat their food with their hands, as they commonly did in Rome in those days. And from her, the sleeve of her gown, she produced a small two-pronged golden fork. And the court accounts say that the assembly just sort of gasped at this, and then she ate her food delicately with the fork. Some people were stunned by how elegant that was, and others thought it was sinful and unchristian <laughs> and complained about it. What do you know about the introduction of the fork and eating, eating irons? Well, it's a, say, I, I have a sort of bullies? very great personal interest in this because my great grandfather, who was a phenomenal man of a great literary talent, he wrote a, a number of books, including Lead and Jewelry in the Middle Ages, A Short History of Rotherham. Um, uh, the Origins of Part Singing, and his, his most seminal book, which was A Short History of the Fork. <laughs> and, a short uh, one. Presumably he, a, he could have written a much longer one. Than some yeah, one. well, who knows? <laughs> I mean, he was an extraordinary man who... Uh, he always refused to dine with anybody because he said that uh, arguments or conversations that he wasn't completely in control of interfered with, his, with the functioning of his gastric juices and prevented him from sleeping at night. <laughs> anyway, uh, one of the many books that this great Edwardian character would scribble in the boudoir of his house, not far from Chesterfield in Sheffield, and incidentally, he once with a friend looked out from his vast house, Renishaw Hall in Derbyshire, with a friend and said, do you know there's no one between us and the Locker Lampsons? Ignoring the fact that there was Sheffield in between him and the Locker Lampsons. <laughs> So he wrote this history of, the, history of the Fork, although I've never actually found a copy of it, so it might be complete garbage. But I discovered in my first book an amazing man called Thomas Coriat, who in the early 1700s decided to flee his Dorset village and go travelling around Europe. And there was a day in Italy where he made two extraordinary discoveries. One was um, what he called the umbrella, which he said that the Italians used to shield their heads from the sun. And he told his friends about that. And they went, why would anyone want to do that? Of course, you know, umbrellas became quite useful in due course. And the other one was a fork. 
and he spied these smart Italian gentlemen prodding their meat with a fork. And he told his friends about that who laughed at him and said, why would anyone want to use a fork? Because, of course, a fork is only a social nicety. You don't need a fork to get food from plate to mouth. It was always the hand and bread. You know, soup comes from words sop, which actually related to the piece of bread that you use to dip in the soup. So it's only really social niceties that have seen the fork go from a two-pronged to a three-pronged to a four-pronged thing that is literally a dainty, unnecessary thing. Podcast. Broadcast. And online. You're listening to Conversations with Richard Feidler. Find out more about the Conversations podcast. Just head to abc.net.au slash conversations. I'm struck how often the kitchen is the crucible for all this sort of political and social change. You write about how Henry VIII, King Henry VIII, famously had dissolved a great many of Britain's monasteries. Tell me how the shutting down of those monasteries led to the creation of the great English pub. Well, these were great refractories, weren't they? I mean, this was a time, and you still see some semblance of it in some parts of Europe and some parts of the world, where strangers would travel and it would be expected that you would alight at a monastery and that's where you would get food. And so it was a real problem for travellers when the monasteries were sort of disestablished because where would people get, get rest? But of course, you know, human endeavour and ingenuity is it always comes up with new solutions. And so gradually you saw inns occurring. And actually, if you look at the, the map of Britain, you can see where the inns and taverns developed, and I think inns were where you had a horse, a tavern is more uh, a place where, you just, where you'd have a meal as, as well as stay in the night. You can see them at intersections of where the great coach routes went up and down the country. It's what I call the, the theory of unintended consequences, that the need to dine out, the need to have sustenance was fulfilled by entrepreneurial people who probably were cooking in monasteries. And exactly the same thing happens in the turn of the 18th century in French revolutionary France, because there's Robespierre chopping our heads off of all the toffs. And of course, those households had a huge amount of staff from the, the sort of hotelier, the manager, to all of the men in their, and women in their, their liveries. So they needed work. And what happened is they slowly gravitated towards provincial towns and cities and set up restaurants. They had the livery of their master. And so you would find quite smartly dressed staff so and we get the formalised garb of the waiter. Well, yeah, absolutely, because they, were, they came from the formalised running of grand houses. And so you've got this extraordinary, as I say, unintended consequence of Robespierre and his cronies eating in smart restaurants that had developed precisely because they'd chopped the heads off their bosses. It also made me wonder, as you write at this time, this is when restaurants become larger enterprises. You have the invention of the stove, the, the more complex form of the stove, and you have a lot more people working there. I just w was wondering if, if the Revolutionary Wars, the Napoleonic Wars, where huge armies had to be assembled, put together and fed by army cooks, led to this new kind of discipline, this sort of militaristic type organisation that is so prevalent in the kitchen, even today, where you almost expect sous chefs and under you know, to, to salute. Well, it's not his ranks. It's, and it's not surprising that it's known as the battery de cuisine, is it? And I think it was really the chefs of the early 19th century who formalised dining, who formalised the idea of different courses coming, who separated the sweet and the savoury. You know, it was very much a medieval thing of sweet, savoury appearing on the same plate. But I think that chefs have spent millennia trying to temper and control heat. And the most sort of up-to-date modern methods of cooking are all about the precise control of temperature. In fact, it was uh, Alexis Soyer who really was the first person in London to took advantage of the, the new Victorian metropolitan gas pipes that were piped into people's houses. And the Garrett Club in Piccadilly was the first 
great restaurant and it was Alexis Sawyer's domain and he created this amazing kitchen. It was the first time where, when they reopened the, uh, the Reform Club, that the members actually went down and looked in the kitchen before they then went to look at their new library and, and dining quarters because they'd heard that this was the most extraordinary kitchen. It was all about the control of fire. And so chefs have long tried to be more precise than the last one. There's a great book called The Cook's Oracle, written in 18, about 1810, where the, the writer goes to great lengths to castigate all books that have come before him because the recipes are too vague. And he goes, you know, at last I'm going to show you precise instructions. I wonder how often we get innovation in cooking and cuisine from famine, from starvation. So many of the great dishes we know in Chinese food, for example, come from people being forced to experiment when there's been a terrible famine, there's been a drought, or there's been a flood on the Yangtze, and so you need to find new ways of cooking things you didn't think you could cook as food before. I've been to Iceland a few times, and they've been put under a lot of pressure to have what they call their national dish there, which is halkatla, which is fermented shark. And when I say fermented, I mean rotten. They let the, the natural rotting fermentation process destroy the, the toxicity of the shark, and it sort of becomes gelatinous. And Anthony Bourdain said it was the most disgusting thing he's ever eaten in his life. But I, I wonder if you've got any thoughts on that, about how innovation, does it come from plenty or from starvation? Well, there's nothing like limitation to exercise the mind, is there? I mean, I know, you know, personally, if you decide to give up meat, it makes you really think about eating fish. If you decide to not drink any more red wine, it makes you think about improving your knowledge of white. So when you impose limitations upon people, it does make you sort of, you know, think. And I think that's why COVID was quite good for restaurateurs, because it made them have to flex their, their wings and think carefully about what they did. And it makes you really have to think about how you can survive, how you can, you know, retell the story of the world through food. A large part of your book is about the evolution of British cuisine, which is very lovely in a great many places these days. In the past, it hasn't been, and you've been quite blunt about that. In fact, you quote the philosopher Bernard Levin, who said in the 1960s that British restaurant food was basically, in his words, disgusting. Many people blame that on the introduction of wartime rationing. What was going on during the wars, and, and why do you think that might have had an effect on the British palate and the kind of food British people well, ate? Well, the, the period of rationing is actually fascinating because it was imposed partly in order to prevent the country from starving, so that if you controlled what people ate, then you would be able to fend off, fend off the possibility of, you know, when you had an unlim you know, not a limitless supply, people would be able to cope and they'd get used to it. Rationing did, wasn't imposed upon the British public from, from day one. It was staggered. And alongside it went a very detailed plan of, of marketing and PR. You know, first of all, there was the great National Registration Day in September of 1939, where for the first time, you know, every sort of man and woman had to register. And if you didn't, you wouldn't get your ration book, which was basically your passport to eat. There were two things that you had to, people said you had to take with you if your house was on fire, your ration book and your gas mask. Those were the two most important things. And rationing was orchestrated by the government based upon largely the First World War when the country very nearly starved. And so there was a very careful plan that had basically put into effect. The man at the top was an extraordinary man called Lord Woolton. And he was a, a working class boy from Lancashire called Fred Marquis, who was a great businessman, had a knack for retail, and ended up working for a Jewish family called the Cohens, who had a, who had a firm called Lewis's. And he helped he joined it when he was very young, helped over the, over the next 20 years build it up to be one of the biggest and most successful department stores in the UK. He ended up buying Selfridges from Gordon Selfridge, and he was thinking of retiring in his sort of 50s and 60s on the, on the onset of war when Neville Chamberlain asked him to be Minister of Food because he quite clearly had demonstrated that he had serious organisational skills. And so he was put in charge of the Ministry of Food. And in great secrecy in about July 1940, the entire offices of the Ministry of Food were exiled to Colwyn Bay, a sleepy little Welsh town, and no one seemed to have known about it. I mean, I came across memos from department to department asking where the Ministry of Food was. And not even, not a single bomb fell on Colwyn Bay during, during the Second World War. The enemy never discovered it was there. 
they had every sort of department, including BBC studios, radio studios. They had studios for deciphering cables. And it was from there that the ration was organised. And I think one of the reasons the Brits kind of got through the Second World War was because there, you know, there was a kind of patriotic and sort of rather keen fervour. So we, we all survive on absolutely nothing. We all yes. eat the most disgusting food and be fine. <laughs> and it's one of the reasons why the British did survive and why, you know, I mean, I was talking about this the other day that, um, you know, if you think about all the diets that have been imposed upon people, you know, whether it's the Stone Age or whether it's uh, intermittent fasting, there's only one diet that's been successfully imposed upon a nation and that's the ration diet. And it does work uh, because... Um, you know, rates of mortality, infant mortality, were never better after the war. Um, dental health was never better. There was basically no instances of obesity. And now we have an era where we can eat what we want, when we want, and we're fatter, and fatter than ever. My wife comes, she's a brilliant cook, and she comes from a Singaporean food tradition. But her big foodie hero is Elizabeth David, the great Elizabeth David, the British, British writer. What kind of an impact did she have on British food in the post-war years? Well, she was the first person really to write about food post-war with a sort of romantic edge. She talked about her experiences through Europe. She talked about places where she'd stayed where they hung basil and thyme from the, you know, the wooden eaves of the kitchen. She was the first sort of middle-class food writer to romanticise the idea of eating. So Elizabeth David captured the minds of people and actually described food in wonderful ways and set alight the idea that there were possibilities and that food could be something you could enjoy rather than could just sustain you. In Australia, the food was pretty how's your father for <laughs> a very long while, but it was the arrival in the post-war years of large groups of migrants from, first of all, from Southern Europe and then from Asia that transformed the cuisine and the country at the same time. When I lived in England in the early 90s, by far the best food to be had was from the subcontinent. Indian, Pakistani, Bengali, Bangladeshi restaurants in the East End, cheap and really good food. The, the food that's served in those restaurants, how closely did they resemble the dishes that they originate from? Well, I think in the same way that the British army insisted that food that they ate in India be sort of mild and dull, that I think the, the Bangladeshi immigrants tried to replicate that to try and keep the English happy. But, you know, we've been eating curries for several hundred years. You know, our links with India go, you know, far beyond that. And you can see recipes for curries in 19th century cookbooks. But again, it's an example of how chefs are sort of trying to reinvent the wheel and so on. And, you know, we had rather a bland Bangladeshi cuisine. And then, you know, now we have a sort of acutely local you know, literally, there are restaurants in Mayfair now that sort of focus on a small village in northern Bengal, <laughs> you know. So um, it's always good to have something to sort of rebel against. But I think you're right. London in the 1970s sort of and early 80s was basically Gavroche, loads of shitty Italian restaurants and a whole load of Indians. You write about the arrival of fast food, the innovations of the McDonald brothers, who set up the first McDonald's in California, which was taken over by Ray Kroc and used all those technological innovations to produce... Fast food, reliable food that was the same no matter wherever you got it. And the origins of Taco Bell and others as well. I wonder if it had to be that way in the English-speaking world because it was seen as a, a revolutionary thing to provide cheap food. They made a point at the time of saying, we're not serving food for teenagers anymore. This is for the family. And you deserve a break today, mum. Let's go to McDonald's and so mum doesn't have to cook. But then all these other cultures have had street food, good, far more nutritious far more delicious food. I wonder why it had to be that way in the English-speaking world. What do you think about all that? I don't know. I mean, I think it's interesting that the, the McDonald's developed. McDonald's developed at the same time as the development of the motor car. You know, the automation of Ford motor cars and the automation of, of the creation of cars very much mirrored the automation of food. And I think it was that idea of the excitement of it. And those two things sort of went hand in hand. It felt like the spirit of the age, if you like. I don't know why we haven't really had a, a, a spirit of food culture in the UK. You can blame the fact that it took us rather a while to have a sort of culinary awakening on the Industrial Revolution because the Industrial Revolution savaged the, the original agrarian society and the great excitement was to move to the cities and move you know, along with the times and the excitement of the factory and so on. And whereas I think if you look at Europe, a lot of the peasant cultures survived and 
that was rooted in seasons and rooted in the countryside, whereas we in Britain were more excited about technology and the, you know, the, 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 the evolution of the tin can, and canned food was far more exciting, the idea of you know, a turnip in January. I remember seeing an episode of a, one of those Gordon Ramsay shows where he dragged some, some dreadful American so-called chef off to a proper Italian place around the corner and just asked this weary Italian chef what the principles of his cooking were. And he said, simplicity and freshness, just straight off the top like that. Do you have basic principles you, you look to when you go to a restaurant these days? Uh, if it doesn't have a tasty menu, that's quite good. Really? You don't like tasting menus? Uh, I try and avoid them. Why? Um, because I, there's only so much I can eat. And I often, I mean, I made the mistake a couple of years ago where uh, I, I, was, I go on a sort of northern foray to sort of eat in various restaurants. And I did a 10-course a menu, a 10-course dinner in a restaurant in Birmingham, an Indian. The next morning I got up and went to uh, Sheffield, had 12 courses for lunch, and then went to Leeds and had another 15 for dinner. And I just realised if I was going to do much more of that, I was going to keel over. So I, I understand how the theatre of the tasting menu is great if you do it once in a while. But when every single provincial restaurant around the country is a tasting menu, you, you know, I literally just want to die. I mean, it just literally, I feel the acid coming up <laughs> my throat. It's not very social either, is it? Because you've, if you've got a group of friends around a table and you're all doing the tasting menu, the conversation's about to get started. This, someone's halfway through an anecdote yeah. and the waiter's come round again to say, yeah, now, there was a, listen to me, I've got to tell you something. I reviewed food. this place in London the other day and I was subjected to sort of, you know, about 16 courses between which there was an explanation. And it was, a, what, it was, I was in this bewildering fog of confusion because I was speaking to this old friend of mine who got some job working for some media agency who was trying to explain what she did and I had no idea. I was, you know, do you make something? Do you put something somewhere and sell it to someone? And it was just all about, just I couldn't get at what she was talking about. And in between that, every two seconds, the waiter would turn up and tell us about the fact that, you know, these particular scallops hand-dived with a special glove and the scallops were brought to the surface with great loving care and carried on a tray to the, to the truck that then brought them at a particular temperature to the restaurant where they were delicately laid onto coals of sustainable charcoal <laughs> made from English beech wood and then cooked precisely 96 degrees for three and a half minutes, at which point the scallop was then taken and added to this bowl of lute of pulverized cauliflower with a broccolini sauce, at which point the lobster, oh, again, beautifully curated, is brought to the United you know, States well, And then, and with this dish, so, you know, the wine, and he says, oh, I just can't deal with this, you know, I just can't do it, just shut up, you know, come on. And there is this thing where the chef is just so passionate about telling you about their life story, um, when you just, just want to eat and talk to somebody. Now, there is, a, you know, there is an excuse. That there are times when this really works, OK? I mean, I admire chefs, but there is a reason why there's a kitchen and a door so they can stay in there, <laughs> you know? And, you know, when I... <laughs> when I... When I, I, offer, I feel MasterChef, and MasterChef is interesting because the chef brings you the food, right? And, and you kind of, oh, he, he cooked it? Oh, my God. That's why you want a waiter, someone nice and clean and pristine, not sweating. You know, sometimes you sort of see the sweat on the plate and you go, oh my God. <laughs> there's a trend now where chefs are actually bringing food. You know, they give them a chance to sort of, it's not just because there's a staff shortage, maybe it is. Um, they give a chance to the chef to come and sort of talk, talk at the table. Because people think the chefs can't really speak, so it gives them the opportunity to show that they can actually talk. You got into trouble a few years ago at Waitrose magazine when someone wanted you to do an article on vegans. And, uh, have your views on veganism evolved since then, though, William? <laughs> Under threat of um, all sorts of things. I, I, you know, I'd never had a problem with, with vegans. It was just sort of was a strange moment in my life where a flippant email became an international incident. And I, I remember my boss was somewhere like, uh, he was on business in America, and he said, I've woken up, and on the BBC site, he said, there are two stories, there's a riot in El Salvador, and then there's you <laughs> being rude to a vegan. What's going on? I went, uh, uh, um, uh. It was a weird one, because it annoyed me, because actually, we'd given vegans quite a lot of coverage, and I mean, I think we were the first food magazine in the UK to create an entirely vegetarian issue where I actually even refused adverts that weren't plant-based and had a battle with our publisher to do that, and I was quite proud of that. 
And so this girl emailed and said, you know, suggested a series on, on vegan cooking. And I'd spent the last sort of 15, 20 years cultivating the greatest minds and recipe writers to do stuff for me. And someone pops out of nowhere saying, assuming that, that because they're vegan, they can have an entire column. So I just flirted with her and sort of made some light jokes. And uh, next thing it was, it was on BuzzFeed, then the mail, and uh, my remarks were not taken out of context because I did say it. They're in an email, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I remember my boss always used to say, never put in an email what you wouldn't run read out in court. And it's something I keep forgetting <laughs> even now. Um, so have my views evolved? Not especially. My philosophy on food is local, seasonal, and the closer you can get to the origin, the better. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for alternating the foods that you eat. I believe in the idea of meat-free Mondays. So I like the general, natural, cyclical nature of the food process. William, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank William Sidbull. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. William Sitwell is the author of A History of Food in 100 Recipes and The Restaurant, A History of Eating Out. Many thanks to Kathleen Drum and Bridget van der Zijp at the Auckland Writers' Festival for making it happen. I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website, abc.net.au slash conversations. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.